This podcast is Challenging Opinions and is presented by William Campbell. Thank you for downloading the Challenging Opinions podcast for October 1st, 2018. In the 1980s, Dire Straits sang about money for nothing. In this podcast, I'll talk to someone who doesn't quite advocate chicks for free, but does think that everyone should get a salary for, well, doing nothing. Challenging Opinions is the podcast where ideas are tested. Whether you are left or right, conservative or progressive, devout or skeptic, what matters is the strength of your argument, not the strength of your voice. Coming up on today's podcast. A common proposal would be $1,000 a month for every adult or in some proposals, children too, maybe going to their guardians. Who's going to pay? And yeah, this is often the first question that, that comes up in, in the basic income discussion. Where does all that money come from? Uh, well, you know, the, the short answer is the government. We'll have that full interview in a few minutes' time. On a Skype line now, I have Owen Poindexter. He's a freelance writer. He's a former Democratic candidate for the California Assembly. And he's also the presenter of the Basic Income podcast. Owen, what's a basic income? Uh, basic income is the idea of giving everyone in a country, a city or a state, however you're doing it, a cash dividend on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, a common proposal would be $1,000 a month for every adult or in some proposals, children too, maybe going to their guardians or their parents um, on a regular basis. And it doesn't have to be $1,000, but uh, just regular cash dividends on a universal basis. Okay, so just let's, so I'm getting this straight. What you're saying is that people, everybody in society should get money every month for free. Correct. Okay, who's going to pay? <laughs> uh, well, you know, the, the short answer is the government. Um, and yeah, this is often the first question that, that comes up in, in the basic income discussion. Where does all that money come from? One thing to note is if I'm taxing you $1,000 and then giving you $1,000, okay, there's a you know minuscule transfer cost in there, but I haven't really spent any money there. Oh, hold there on, hold on, very... hold on. All my libertarian friends would say, hang on a second, government doesn't do minuscule transfer costs. Government has often quite high transaction costs. So you might have to tax me way more than $1,000 to be able to, on average, to be able to give me $1,000. Isn't this terribly inefficient? Oh, uh, I would say quite the opposite, because what government often does, what your libertarian friends would probably say is, OK, we, we take in some money, we evaluate who needs it, we evaluate, you know, what's the best way to help people, whether it's a, a housing grant, um, a food security program, uh, maybe some kind of mental health program. And uh, then we find the best way to deliver that. And uh, we you know, work with people and the actual assistance, you know, comes many steps down the road where with a basic income program, all we do is we, we take in money. Government's pretty good at doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we, we give it out. And these days that can happen instantly. You know, I, I can send you $100 right now uh, just with your email address. Mm -hmm. And once you get that set up, it's just pretty much set it and forget it. Okay. Does the modeling of this indicate that taxes would have to increase significantly? It really depends on how you do it. So one idea that I'm very interested in is the idea of a carbon dividend. So this is where you would put a fee or a tax on carbon extraction. So, you know, things like, you know, taking coal out of the ground, that, that sort of thing. And, um, and so we can say you can do that, but it's going to cost you a little bit of money each time. And because that we're raising the cost of energy, that makes things like the price of gas go up in construction. But then we give that money back automatically in a universal dividend. So, yes, the cost of living goes up, but mostly for very high income people who are living much more consumptive lifestyles and you're building multiple houses and flying planes everywhere. And um, for most people, they're both getting money and we're fighting climate change. So there are ways of doing it where. Most of us won't really see the the taxation effects. Another idea that's very popular in the basic wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You say most of us won't see the taxation effect. That means some of us will see the taxation effect with a vengeance. 
list, but those the, some of us are uh, tend to be very high income individuals. And um, and with a carbon dividend, you're probably not going to get to a thousand dollars a month per person anyway. That's more in the the size of you know a couple hundred dollars perhaps at, at the higher levels. Um, and those who will be seeing the effects in general can really afford it. Uh, another idea with a, a similar um, similar distribution scheme is a land value tax, where mm -hmm. we would tax the value of the land, so not the improvements, not your home or your building or whatever is on it, but just the unimproved value of the land itself, because that really reflects the um, the value of where you live, the sort of collective value of what's around you. Mm -hmm. And um, and so and again, <laughs> the the people who are, are going to get hit hardest by that tend to be the ones who can afford it. And everyone's getting a dividend back from it as well. So uh, the break even point is sort of a you know, comfortably middle class person where they're probably giving in as much as they're taking. And people above that can afford it. And people below that, you know, their lives would be radically changed. Okay, I want to just look at that a little bit. Because first of all, I'm not really convinced that in all of those cases, the government can take that tax, process it, and divide out that money quite as efficiently as, as you might hope. But to put that aside for a minute, and I think that's a real objection, but let's put it aside for a minute because I think you don't agree with me. We're not going to go very far with that. Why would we want to be doing this in the first place? You agree that there is some cost to doing this. Whatever that cost is, why would you want to incur that cost? Sure. Now, um, that's a great question. And there are a, a lot of good reasons to do this. Uh, first and foremost, cash is the most efficient, effective way to fight poverty. Uh, this is a yep. line you hear a lot in the basic income world, but poverty is not a lack of character. It is a lack of cash. And when you address that problem directly, you start to see a lot of the issues, a lot of the symptoms of poverty start to get alleviated, start to go away. So you see improvements in healthcare, care, um, improvements in education. Um, you know, people start can become entrepreneurs because it's very hard to be an entrepreneur if you're working two low wage jobs. And so there's all these societal improvements across the board that come just from providing some economic security. Yeah, you, one thing you said there, let me pause you on it. You said if it's hard to become an entrepreneur if you were working um, two low-paid jobs, for sure that's true. And however many people it is good for society to be entrepreneurs, that number is certainly non-zero. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to get people to work and maybe you have to get people to work fairly low paid jobs, at least at the start. How do you persuade them to work low paid jobs if they've got a salary before they even get out of bed in the morning? Sure. Um, well, let's start with the, the research, which is that in the basic income trials we've seen, there's essentially no effect on unemployment when you're giving someone you know, a basic level of unconditional cash. And again, we're talking something those like, guys say, $1,000 a month. <laughs> and those well, guys didn't ask me. And I know a whole, I could introduce you to a whole load of people who say, who would say that if you get a whack of money every month, would you use that just to buy time, just to basically get some or even all of your life back? Well, think about the sort of jobs you would quit if you were getting in the USA a thousand dollars a month. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people can't even pay their rent with that much money. And even if you're paying your rent, your utilities, your groceries, you're not really paying for anything else. So yes, maybe you could live a very basic lifestyle. And that's an important point to point out is that people would not have food insecurity if they were getting a basic income. So that's, you know, that's a point in favor. Um, what but, would you just, so that people understand what you're saying there, you would be pretty much guaranteed to have enough food for the, at the end of the month if you had a basic income. Right. And, you know, not so much where I live in California, but in many places you would, you would not be voluntarily home or you'd not be involuntarily homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, in many parts of the world, a thousand dollars a month is enough to f afford a, a basic apartment and some groceries. And I feel like we are at a point in the prosperity of our society where that should not be something where uh, I, I feel like it's OK to guarantee just that level of subsistence. Um, because, you know, there are a lot of things we do guarantee. We guarantee roads and we guarantee libraries. And in some places you can it's easy enough to get on the Internet why do we have these things and yet we 
leave it just to the market to decide if people are able to feed themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, but getting back well, to let, the, let me the, suggest an answer mm-hmm. Be- because nobody would pick the crops if you didn't. Well, sure they would. You just have to pay them a, a decent enough wage that they're motivated to. Um, you know, there are jobs that we are which willing then to puts to up the price of the crop, which then puts that 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 those groceries out of the reach of people on the basic income as you set it and puts you under pressure to increase it. Wasn't this essentially what uh, Robert Mugabe tried in uh, in Zimbabwe? You just start printing money and eventually, you know, you can't even get a bus ticket with a twenty five trillion dollar note. So I can't speak to that example because I, I don't know enough about okay. Zimbabwe. But this is this but, is uh, this is highly inflationary, isn't it? Uh, well, no, actually, it isn't. There actually have been studies on this. Um, there, they um, did some experiments in Mexico where they gave either cash dividends or in-kind donations, such as food, mm-hmm. to um, sort of these remote villages in Mexico. What they found is that if you have an actual market where you know if one grocery store raises their prices, the and another one doesn't, uh, you can just go to that other grocery store. Then you don't see inflationary effects. Uh, you no, only no, but see you're saying no we, need to, we need to pay, for example, which would be a typical low-wage job. We need to pay the person on who's picking the crop, for example, a whole lot more to encourage them to do a hard, difficult labor job when they could just perhaps survive on their basic income. So that for sure, that's creating a significantly extra costs in the food chain. Well, I, I think you're, you're a bit quick to, to assume that um, the, these labor costs would go up as much as you think, because again, there are a lot of jobs where people will still work a you know $15 an hour job. Uh, because again, a thousand dollars a month is not going to, you know, cover uh, much more than your basic subsistence. People still want to be no, no, able no, but to Owen, Owen, stay, spend stay, money stay, and have stay, freedom. Stay with, me, stay with me. Stay with me on this. You're putting a thousand bucks or whatever. We can use that as a, as a placeholder figure. It doesn't have to be precisely that. But you're putting a thousand bucks a month into the pocket of everybody in the economy. And with mm-hmm. that thousand bucks, they're either going to buy more stuff. Are they going to work less and replace a thousand dollars of wages with that thousand dollars, thousand dollars that they're getting for free? Right. So or they'll one, save it. Yeah. Uh, uh, potentially save it. Although that's, that means just spending it later, which just delays the problem. It doesn't, doesn't address the problem. So if they are buying more stuff, uh, buying more of a fixed supply of stuff, then they're pushing up the prices. And if they're using that thousand dollars to work less and buy the same amount of stuff, then the economy is producing less. You can't really square that circle, can you? Well, it's um. So you're you're assuming there's a a fixed level of stuff, and maybe when it comes to things like housing, that, for, that for, is something for any, where you for need any to be, gi- for oh. any given amount of human into the human input into the economy, there is a fixed level of stuff. Um, well, I would say the economy has been growing at a, a rampant pace for for decades, mm-hmm. and I think people always find a way to consume more. But really, what, what I'm more interested in is that low income and middle so income either people they consume more or they work less. But that doesn't work right across the economy, does it? If people were able to consume more, well, a lot of what they would be consuming more is their their basic needs, you know, food, uh, school supplies. Um, I, I feel like the economy can handle um, poor people being able to, um, you know, have have these basic things that most of us just kind of take for granted. Mm-hmm. Uh, like if I want to take my kid to the zoo, I don't think, well, that's going to cost twenty dollars. And you know, I, I we can afford that level of extra consumption. Um, you know, I I, I think. Um, you know, it's not like the economy has a perfect level of consumption right now, especially among low and middle income people. And that no, 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 but, but I think, but I think that your example is egregious because going to the zoo doesn't require any extra economic output. But what most people might do is buy more or better quality food, or they might buy for example, rent a nicer place. But if you don't have more people working more to build more nice places or more people working more to produce more or nicer food, then you've just put inflation into the system. But what you're saying is that you would 
uh, create, we'd create new markets or, you know, new life into existing markets. Mm -hmm. And yet no one would fill the need for that. But that's one thing the free market is quite good at is recognizing where there is more available funds and responding to that need. And we see so many food deserts, just to use the food example, in mm -hmm. low income neighborhoods where you can't get a decent grocery store there because the grocery store doesn't think it can do business there. But if everyone was able to you know, afford some groceries, then mm -hmm. you would see those markets respond. That's possibly true. And there's something to be said for having that as a kickstart element of the economy. But at the end of the day, the total amount of consumption, so if we just disregard money entirely, the total amount of consumption in the economy must be equal to the total amount of production in the economy. That's true, isn't it? Uh, I suppose, yes. And if you're not incentivizing extra production, there can't be any extra consumption. Well, you are incentivizing extra production by allowing for extra consumption. Also, you know, we're, we haven't talked about automation and globalization yet, but we'll talk about that. the talk ability about that to produce... Okay, I mean, this is often where people start in the basic income conversation. I'm actually glad we're only just getting to it now because I think it, it is a little overplayed. Mm -hmm. But one reason people come to the idea of basic income is that um, it's getting much, much cheaper and much easier to produce and even in the information sector to, to do work um, with little to no human labor. And so we have this problem of it's it's too easy to produce um, and not enough people are earning money to consume what we're producing. And so, you know, that that's only going to uh, increase income inequality and create this class of people who are effectively unemployable. Um, you know, it's you hear various predictions, who knows how true they are. But I think we're already seeing really powerful effects of automation and globalization uh, for instance, you could look at our our auto manufacturing sector, mm -hmm. which, you know, there's the whole Detroit went bankrupt, that whole thing. Um, it happened a few years ago in the U.S. Uh, because um, a lot of that work was going overseas. And then we had the recession. And uh, when a lot of people lost their jobs, as the economy started to improve again, most of those jobs did not come back because uh, the work another was example, automated away. Another example that's coming down the line at us, I think, pretty quick, about seven million Americans drive for a living. That number could go to zero pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sure, there will be new jobs of whoever's managing those, you know, those trucks and those cars who are that are, are driving around, but it won't be 7 million. Maybe it'll be 1 million or half a million, or even if it's 3 million, that's still 4 million people who uh, are not, they're not driving. You know, maybe some of them will find jobs, but um, they probably won't be full-time jobs and full-time work is is very much at threat right now. Um, and so we have uh, we're seeing a restructuring of the economy and not really responding to it. And I think basic income is a, a very good first step and perhaps the main step in responding to the economic changes we're seeing just to provide a basic level of security. So, OK, you lose your job at the auto manufacturing plant or as a driver or whatever it is or um, and so, OK, you need to retrain, you need to find something new. You're not going to starve. You might have to pare down to your basic your basic needs, you know, your your rent, your food, and not a whole lot else. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to starve. And if we don't have a way to ensure that, I mean, that's what we're doing right now. And we're going to see a lot of societal upheaval, a lot of tumult, and that's the choice we're making. And I don't think it's a good choice. And I think we need some wide scale universal response to it. And I think basic income is the most powerful, effective way to do that, because when you give people cash, they can take care of their own needs. If I have to predict everyone's needs and respond to those individually and then deliver them individually, that's very difficult. And that's, you know, more bureaucracy than anyone can handle. Um, but cash is, just, is simple and effective and it puts the trust in people. I've been reading your article, 18 Reasons to Support Basic Income in preparing for this. And one of the things, one of the reasons that you give down towards the bottom is artists can be artists. And I think you're kind of saying people can uh, take a while off their job or not work at all and do that painting or write that novel or whatever that they were always dreaming of. How many people would you expect to do that? Uh, I honestly don't know. And, you know, I think there's there's sort of an I find it exciting, the level of uncertainty that we might have in this sort of thing. Again, I would just say, think about 
the jobs you would quit to pursue your passion um, if if you were getting a basic level of subsistence. It's probably not your, you know, whatever, $60,000 a year, like comfortably middle class type job. But there are people out there who are not happy in their jobs. And I would say maybe more and more so these days who, uh, who, who don't who, find fulfillment who in it. the sewers? Uh, people who are, it's the same answer as right now. I mean, would you pay the, clean the sewers for minimum wage? No, I but I might but do, if I might do less. Me, <laughs> yeah. Um, but either we'd get a machine to do it or we'd pay a human enough to do it. And if we can't in this world where people are making billions of dollars and some of them, and we, we can't find enough money to convince someone to, to clean the sewers or we can't build a machine that's going to do it for us, then that's our problem. Um, you know, I feel like, like you, yes, we have jobs that are unpleasant, but we we have jobs that are unpleasant right now, and it's not um it's not that there's people out there who are going to starve and have to you know go to really desperate means if they don't take that one specific job. We just pay enough so people are able to take those jobs, and it's a good idea for them. I, I, um, I have in my mind, oh, and I have in my mind seven or however mil- many million former truck drivers and taxi drivers and other drivers all getting out their oil paints and setting up an easel in their back garden to paint a watercolor or paint a, a Van Gogh masterpiece. And that seems a little bit ridiculous now. But you're actually correct to say that we're moving towards a very significant degree of automation in society. And it seems to me something that's impossibly far away. But do you think that it is a goal for society to aspire to, to essentially automate the whole of society and allow humans to consume their time with leisure? I think it should be a goal of society to make that possible on some basic level. Again, you're probably not going to be living in luxury uh, if you are just if you're not producing producing anything that someone wants to pay for. Um, but I, I think in a society as rich as ours, with our ability to produce as much as much you know housing and food and, and everything else, that, and the fact that we have billionaires who never have to lift a finger again in their lives, and neither do their children or their grandchildren. I think it's a, a fair goal for us to have that that no one should have to go hungry. Okay. No one should have um, to go homeless. One one alternative, which might cost a similar amount of money, which is essentially what a lot of countries in Europe do, is they provide free education all the way through to university, uh, free healthcare, free, of course, at the point of use. It has to be paid for through taxes like anything else. Sure. But that gives a level of security in society. Is that not perhaps a better way to spend that money if you had that much money? And this would be a lot of money. If you had that much money, wouldn't it be better to say, okay, nobody ever goes bankrupt because they got leukemia and they couldn't pay their medical bills? Nobody ever has student debt hanging over them for decades. Wouldn't that be a better way to do it? Well, uh, I don't see these as mutually exclusive, and I do think you know, I'm a strong advocate for universal health care and single-payer health care and, and a robust public education system. And I think, yes, those cost a lot of money from the government, but in many ways they save money in the long term in that people are um, you know, uh, using preventative services and they are um, – able to contribute more to the economy and, you know, they're, they're staying in school as opposed to, you know, um, whatever else they're doing. Um, and so, um, I, I think, but yeah, I think you can make a case for all of these programs that yes, there, it's a lot of money at the point of transfer, but in the long run, you are, are saving money by having a healthier, better educated, more prosperous society, um, and I guess the, the last point I'd make there is if you are still struggling to find work with your education and your, even with your free healthcare, and we do have a lot of, you know, master's degree students in, or, you know, master's graduates in the U S who are, are working at coffee shops because mm-hmm. you know, in graduates. some places the economy is quite tight here. Um, you know, do you, do you still have, Security. Um, yeah, I guess you have better security because your your healthcare is is covered. Um, and again, I, I think we we should be doing that anyway. Uh, but I don't see these as mutually exclusive, and I see all of them as a good bargain for everyone. 
What's your dream for what you can do when you'll uh, only have to work when you choose to? Uh, well, you know, honestly, I'm <laughs> I, I'm living something like that dream right now. I'm a, a freelance writer, which is, you know, it's a very privileged thing to be able to do, to to, to write. And, and also I have my podcast, which I really enjoy, and I'm able to spend time with friends and with my family. Um, I am pretty much living the life I want to live, honestly, which is sort of a new thing for me. And, uh, you know, if you were giving me another thousand dollars a month, I would say, thanks, I'm going to save it or I'm going to, you know, go out to dinner once in a while or, or whatever I do with it. But my my life wouldn't actually change very much. Owen Poindexter, freelance writer and presenter of the Basic Income Podcast. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thanks for having me on. If you like the Challenging Opinions podcast, please rate and review the show on iTunes and other podcast providers. Share it on Facebook and Twitter. Tell your friends. But most important, make your view heard. Email podcast at challengingopinions.com. Go to the website for sources and links to what we were talking about. And while you're there, please like the show on Facebook, follow at ChallengingO on Twitter, and follow Owen Poindexter at Owen Poindexter, and get in touch with me if you can suggest a guest or topic for a future show. Also, you can find out how to subscribe to the podcast for free on your computer, your phone, or by email. It's all at www.challengingopinions.com. And I do have a Patreon account. Thanks to the people who signed up as patrons so far. I really appreciate that. It means that I can devote more time to research and finding interesting guests. And if you can do the same as them, I'd really appreciate it. You can find all the details on the website. The Challenging Opinions podcast is produced and presented by me, William Campbell. Thank you for listening.